Good morning everyone this is Sumitra I would like to introduce the speaker for today Dr Pavan Kumar NG Reddy Dr Reddy has done his BSc in microbiology and MSc in biotechnology from SK University Anantapur India and PhD in biochemistry from Goethe University Frankfurt Germany Sir has vast experience to begin with Sir has done his summer internship at Central Drug Research Institute Lucknow in 2002 worked as manager during 2002 to 3 at Shanta Biotechnics Hyderabad and project assistant during the period 2003 to 6 at CCMB Hyderabad he has completed his phd in the year 2011 and this was at uh, Johann Wolfgang Goethe University Frankfurt Germany and uh, Dr Reddy's experience includes working on signaling mechanisms in blood stem cells in mouse models and crispr cas9 screening in rna splicing factor mutated in leukemia he is currently research fellow at harvard medical school boston ma he has received many awards and honors to begin with he's won an oral presentation in eacr febs meeting on molecular mechanisms in signal transduction and cancer at greece in 2009 he won travel award in the year 2010 from wilseed meeting germany and travel award at ash annual meeting los angeles in the year 2013 He's won a presentation at the Stem Cell Day of Harvard Stem Cell Institute 2014 scholar award from American Society of Hematology in the year 17 poster award from FASEB Hematological Malignancies Meeting Saxton's River VT and finally scholarship from Harvard Hughes Medical Institute HHMI to attend the course on experimental models of human cancer at the Jackson Laboratory Bar Harbor ME thank you dr reddy for accepting our invitation and being a part of this webinar come fdp series thank you very much and now i would like request you to begin the session thank you uh thank you sumitra for that kind of introduction uh i like to thank cbit uh, biotechnology faculty members uh, especially aruna for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity to present my work here um today my talk is going to be on two, two it will be a two part talk and discussing about hematopoietic stem cell function and leukemia in the first part i will talk about pact to kinase signaling in in hematopoietic stem cell function uh, this was the work i did in the williams lab at the boston children's hospital and harvard medical school uh, as a research fellow so there are two uh, different types of stem cells uh, the embryonic stem cells and the adult uh, stem cells embryonic stem cells are those uh, present in the blastocyst after fertilization within the egg of early uh, divisions these uh, hem- em- embryonic stem cells are totipotent and they can give rise to all pluripotent stem cells uh, some of these uh, stem cells uh, migrate and form the tissue tissues within the body and such tissue such tissue resident tissue specific uh specialized stem cells are called adult stem cells today in my talk i'm going to be focusing mostly on the hematopoietic stem cells these are a type of adult stem cells so the hematopoietic stem cells are the blood forming stem cells in human beings reside in the bone marrow and within the bone marrow they have uh, some micro environments which are called bone marrow niche in which uh, hematopoietic stem cells uh, attach as well as reside uh, and self renew they 
have the unique ability to make themselves uh, divide into two identical copies of themselves as well as differentiate and produce uh, multi multi potent progenitors that go on to differentiate either into lymphoid progenitors or into myeloid progenitors uh, within the myeloid and uh, progenitors you can have uh, neutrophils basophils eosinophils monocytes and platelets red cells uh, these are very important for uh, fighting the infections as well as uh, protecting uh, cells from uh, bleeding as well and carry oxygen to brain and other tissues on the other side of the the second branch of this uh, the blood cells are lymphoid cells which are b t cells and plasma cells these help uh again also fight infections and provide long term immunity uh, in the in the for the for the animals bone marrow transplantation has been uh, a, used in a, a very routinely in clinic to uh, treat cancers and and uh, defective uh, genetic diseases uh, one of the ways that you can do is to for a patient you, you can in, give them uh, stem cell mobilizers uh, into blood stream that leads to migration of bone marrow stem cells out into the peripheral blood where you can collect that blood and uh, isolate stem cells either you can cryopreserve them or uh, treat the patient uh, while you cryopreserve you treat the patient with the cancers either multiple myeloma leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome uh, it, they receive chemotherapy and radiation therapy uh, after the therapy you can retransplant the isolated healthy stem cells so they can have normal healthy blood, blood production in on the other uh, side of the uh, therapy hematopoietic stem cells can also be used uh, to isolate stem cells that are that have genetic defects uh, such as uh, sickle cell disease thalassemia other immuno deficiencies uh, severe combined immune deficiency as is called aldrich syndrome and you can correct those deficiencies in the stem cells and give those stem cells back into the patients uh, to treat the disease uh this correction can happen by either lentiviral vectors or crispr cas9 editing uh this is particularly of very importance in in recent days of uh, uh additional new capabilities of crispr editing uh brings a lot of new therapies uh, for the patients so when when you introduce hematopoietic stem cell into the blood stream uh it can be uh giving back uh, healthy stem cells or stem cells that are edited uh to correct certain genetic diseases uh they are introduced into the intravenously injected into the blood and for them the most important thing that needs to happen for a stem cell is to uh, migrate to its uh, niche which which is in the bone marrow and this process of uh, stem cells migrating from uh, blood stream into the bone marrow niche is called homing and stem cells have various number of receptors uh, those receptors help them control their migration into the bone marrow as well as uh, survival within the bone marrow and attach uh, strongly to the bone marrow micro environment and once they attach and, and populate the bone marrow they start self renew and differentiate and migrate out produce the blood forming uh, cells which again mobilize out of the bone marrow and comes into the blood stream uh, the process of homing uh, stem cell self renewal and differentiation and mobilization into the peripheral blood is called uh, hematopoietic en engraftment so there are number of pathways uh, within the stem cells that are regulated uh uh by various number of re receptors when the hematopoietic stem cell binds to uh either blood vessel to extravasate uh, going to the bone marrow 
they that engages the fibronectin receptor or chemokine receptors such as CXCR4. These are chemokine receptors, and uh, within the bone marrow, there is an increased uh, amount of SDF and alpha concentration, and hematopoietic stem cells migrate into the bone marrow niche. Uh, bone marrow, the hematopoietic stem and progenitors also express uh, growth factor receptors such as CKIT, and ha having a CKIT, engaging CKIT with the stem cell factor receptor, stem cell factor also help them both uh, self-renew as well as proliferate. And all the uh, integrin and chemokine receptors and stem cell factor receptors, when they are engaged with their ligands, uh, they lead to activation of rho GTPages, rho rag GTPages. These uh, GTPages uh, exist both in inactive and active, active forms. The uh, rho rag GDP, which is inactive form, when the receptor engages and uh, leads to activation of this pathway, that leads to uh, guanine exchange factor to turn over the GDP for GTP, which can further lead to activation of downstream effectors. And these downstream effectors are very important for regulating stem cell shape, adhesion and migration survival, as well as transcription uh, so that they start to self-renew and, and, and populate the uh, mature blood, blood cells. When I joined the lab, we found that uh, such effector proteins are a group of kinases called PAC2 kinases. And we found a particular role for these in hematopoietic stem cell homing to the bone marrow as well as stem cell engraftment. But we didn't know at the time what was the mechanism, and my uh, project and, and would be to understand this mechanism, how PAC kinases contribute to hematopoietic stem cell uh, function. For, to give you a brief introduction about PAC kinases, uh, these are enzymes. Uh, it's a serine renewing kinase. Uh, it has a C-terminal kinase domain and number of protein protein interacting domains throughout the uh, throughout through the protein structure so the rack or rho gdp binding in the pbd domain induces a structural change which leads to the activation of the pac2 kinase and one such a factor that contributes to the activation is also called beta peaks which is an exchange factor it's a uh, protein, a multimeric protein complex that leads to activation of RAC by exchanging it with uh, GDP, exchanging with GTP to GDP. And there are uh, three different uh, PAC kinase uh, family members, PAC1, which is uh, expressed ubiquitously. And when you delete this in, the, in a mouse uh, system, uh, the mice are healthy and there is uh, everything is normal in there and there is no disease phenotype uh, pack 2 uh, is also a uh, ubiquitous it expresses everywhere and when you delete this the mice die in utero um, that's why there is a conditional mouse that exists pack 3 is a, a kinase that uh, specifically expresses in the brain uh, both human mouse uh, down to east uh, pack kinases are highly conserved So in order to understand uh, the role of PAC kinase, we have constructed a number of uh, lentiviral vectors. What you can see here, is a, a typical structure of lentivirus uh, between LTRs, long terminal repeats. Uh, you can uh, code for the gene of interest. In this case, I have cloned a Cree and a PAC2. Cree is a recombination. When you have a gene marked for deletion, uh, you can have these uh, specific uh, sequences that marks a gene. And when you express Cree, uh, only when you express Cree, the recombination event happens and that deletes the uh, your target gene and makes the cells uh, not express that particular gene. In this case, I have 
uh, a CRE and a T2A and a PAC2. T2A is a uh, small peptide that slips off uh, of the ribosome and makes two proteins, a CRE recombinase and a PAC2 kinase. And we made this particular design for a reason. One, you can delete the uh, endogenous gene. At the same time, you can either introduce a wild type PAC2 kinase uh, to rescue, or you can introduce a kind a PAC2 that is kinase deficient, uh, kinase dead, De meaning you have the enzyme, but it doesn't do its job of phosphorylation. And then there is also a beta pix interaction deficient mutation. Uh, we have cloned all these vectors and it took the stem cells uh, out from the mouse, uh, isolated stem cells from both PAC2 floxed mice. Uh, these are at this stage normal PAC2 expresses as uh, it is in the wild type. Only when you introduce CRE, then that deletes the PAC2 gene and, and the stem cells that you uh, express the CRE become PAC2 negative. So we isolated the stem cells from uh, either wild type mice or a PAC2 floxed mice and then transduced them. We cultured the stem cells from bone marrow for two days and then either transduced them with CRE alone to delete the PAC2. Uh, that makes the stem cells uh, become PAC2 negative. Or we have uh, three different vectors which simultaneously deletes and introduces a, an exogenous PAC2, which is a PAC2 wild type or kinase didn't do beta picks. After transduction uh, on day five, we sort these cells uh, on, a, it's, uh, on a flow cytometer. You can sort G, green expressing, G, green fluorescent protein expressing cells, and you can put these cells back into irradiated mice to see how the function of the stem cells that has no PAC2, that has either PAC2 wild type or a kinase dead or a beta pix mutation, uh, mutated PAC2 expression. And then you, after you inject into irradiated mice, you measure at 16 hours how many cells that you introduced into the bloodstream reach the bone marrow. And at 16 weeks, you let the mice grow uh, leave the mice uh, go for a, 16 weeks. And at 16 weeks, you can now take out the peripheral blood and see how many of the peripheral blood are GFP positive. That way you know that the cells that you introduced uh, replenish the mouse stem cell, mouse uh, blood and all the mouse blood derived stem cells. If they are GFP or not, we will monitor. As well as uh, we measured the migration of the uh, stem cells in, in a gradient STF on gradient in a time-lapse microscopy. We also observed uh, cytoskeletal changes by uh, staining cell, stem cells with uh, a fact in, in a confocal microscopy. First, we wanted to confirm whether our vectors are working as they're supposed to. For this reason, we, we isolated the genomic DNA and amplify the region where PAC2 is uh, targeted. Uh, what you can see on the far left here is a control where you have still a flux allele. They don't, they, we did not express a Cree here. That's why you still see uh, flux allele, uh, meaning there is still a PAC2 uh, gene segment that expresses. But uh, in all the mutants, including uh, Cree expressing or, or PAC2 wild type, PAC2 kinase did or beta pix interaction deficient mutation, we see uh, endogenous PAC2 deletion. At the same time, we observe our uh, exogenous uh, PAC2 that we, in the PAC2 knockout, you don't see any protein expression. That's PAC2 Western blot here. You, after you transduce the stem cells, you isolate protein and measure how much uh, PAC2 is still expressed in cells. Uh, in case of uh, Cree alone transduce, we nicely deleted all the PAC2. Uh, with PAC2 wild type add back, we can still see the PAC2 addition that is from exogenous sources. We also tested if uh, PAC2 kinase dead is really PAC2 kinase dead. This is an in vitro kinase assay in which uh, you incubate uh, PAC2 
the exogenous PAC2, isolate the PAC2 and incubate them with uh, substrate protein MBP, and then uh, run the gel, uh, run a Western blot on those uh, cells, on those uh, on the protein, and observe now uh, phosphorylation of serine residues on the MBP protein. As you can see here with uh, stars, where we have wild the control, when we express PAC2 wild type, it still can phosphorylate here. That's a phosphoserine band. And when we express PAC2 kinase dead, it doesn't make any, uh, it couldn't phosphorylate the MBP substrate protein. And beta pigs can still phosphorylate the substrate protein. These are total cell lysates to observe that uh, PAC2 really expressed. The exogenous PAC2 is uh, HA tagged, which you can see here. So this confirmed us that PAC2 kinase dead that we are expressing is really PAC2 kinase deficient. We also checked uh, whether uh, beta pix uh, interaction deficient mutant is really beta pix interaction deficient. For this, we did a co-immunoprecipitation. You isolate, you pull the PAC2 using a HA antibody and see in that uh, pull downs uh, any beta pics exist. As you can see in the wild type, when we pull down uh, PAC2, that brings down also beta pix protein. Uh, whereas the beta pix de interaction deficient uh, PAC2, we do not see such um, uh, the, the beta pix presence. Again, suggesting both kinase dead mutation is really kinase dead and the beta pix mutation is really beta pix interaction deficient. As you can see, there's no more interaction between the beta pix and the beta pix deficient mutation. So we, we took such stem cells and subjected them to in vitro migration assay. These, uh, you coat a cow slide and you let the stem cells attach to the cow slide and, and on one side, uh, in this case, on the top left corner, we introduce uh, a chemokine that is present in the bone marrow, which is uh, very important for stem cells to migrate to the bone marrow and, and reside in the bone marrow. So we introduce uh, that chemokine that is important for stem cell migration and monitor the cells over a period of time. And by looking at the live video microscopy and how cells migrated, we measured those uh, paths and this is all the stem cell migrated paths from time zero to two hours. Uh, we plotted them on uh, X, Y axis here. All the starting path, uh, starting position is uh, started at the zero, zero, and wherever you see the tracks that ends with cell uh, are the cells that migrated. When we have wild type, these cells nicely migrate towards the SDF1 gradient. When we delete the pack two, those cells are unable to migrate towards uh, SDF1 gradient, suggesting when you delete PAC2, the cells become in, unresponsive to SDF1 alpha uh, chemokine, which is a very critical uh, step for the stem cells to migrate into the bone marrow. But when, I, when we add back into knockout cells a wild type PAC2, they again behave similar to how the control cells behave they start to respond to SDF1 alpha, they start to migrate. And, and in the PAC2 kinase dead, when you express in the knockout cells a kinase dead version, a kinase in the PAC2 that does not have the uh, functional uh, activity, kinase activity, then you couldn't rescue the defects that you have seen in PAC2 kinase dead with the restoration of the PAC2 kinase dead. And similar was true when we depleted uh, interaction of PAC2 with beta pigs, the stem cells were unable to migrate. And we quantified all those uh, tracks into accumulated distance uh, as well as the Euclidean distance. When you look here, if a stem cell started from here, took all the zigzag path, when uh, ultimately it ended here after two hours of uh, microscopy, the total path that it takes uh, is called all turns and uh, twists that it go through. That's called accumulated distance. 
but total effective displacement from its uh, original start point is called Euclidean distance. When we measure the uh, uh, the accumulated distance, neither control uh, pack two did not have any deficiency there. Pack two cells, knockout cells were able to migrate uh, totally. Only cell, uh, only mutant that did not migrate the stem cells that express the beta pix mutant, which was very significant. Uh, but however, when we measure the Euclidean distance, which is uh, any, a measurement for directionality of the stem cells, in that case, we see a clear differences. When we delete PAC2, the cells lacked the directionality. And when we add a PAC2 back, we could rescue that uh, lack of directionality. However, we couldn't rescue that with either PAC2 kinase dead or beta pix mutation. Uh, suggesting the PAC2 kinase activity as well as its interaction with the uh, beta pigs are essential for the directional migration of stem cells. Again, uh, since uh, RAC uh, signaling is very critical for cytoskeletal reorganization in stem cells, uh, we, we subjected the stem cells again. Uh, we attached the stem cells to fibronectin coated cow slides and then stimulated them with SDF on alpha. So some of the migrational defects can be explained by observing their effect in status uh, within the stem cells. What you can see here is a control cell that is a wild type cell uh, has no pack two deletion. Uh, when you play them, they're round and, and in an unstimulated state. And if you stimulate them with SDF or alpha, they start to form these nice uh, phylopodial structures. These phylopodial structures are very critical for uh, stem cell to migrate in the within the vessels and out of the vessels into the bone marrow. Uh, when we delete PAC2, the cells have these abnormal extended protrusions. And when we stimulate the cells with the SDF1 alpha, they did not form any phylopodial uh, structures. Again, uh, it this explains in part the the phenotype we have we have observed that. Um, stem cells lack directional migration. And this is mainly due to abnormal protrusions of the stem cells, uh, abnormal protrusions, as well as uh, the lack of response. Uh, they couldn't stimulate the SDF1 alpha to the SDF1 alpha and form a phylopodial structure. However, when we, in the knockout cells, if we reintroduce back to wild type, cells are does not have those abnormal protrusions and they start to now respond again to sdf and alpha uh, clearly confirming that pack 2 wild type expression is clearly required for the uh, sdf and alpha induced stem cell migration and a phylopodial formation with a pack 2 kinase dead uh, expression in knockout cells we could not rescue the pack 2 knockout phenotype and cells are still very protruded, very abnormally elongated. Uh, when we express uh, beta pix interaction deficient mutation in PAC2 knockout stem cells, we see these abnormal acting bundles. Uh, that's probably what is contributing to their uh, total lack of migration in accumulated distance. However, interestingly, they have a nice phylopodial response to SDF on alpha. So the, there's a qualitative difference between PAC2 kinase dead and PAC2 beta pix interaction mutation. Uh, in that, PAC2 kinase dead is uh, very similar to PAC2 knockout, but with beta pix, we could rescue the phylopodial formation. However, the, st the stem cells had these abnormal acting bundles which were unable to be resolved on the on, during migration, uh, which probably have led to their strong attachment to the uh, fibronectin and unable to move away towards the SDF1 gradient. So all this uh, data we have quantified here. Uh, what you can see uh, here on the right is control cells. Uh, they have smooth cortical. Uh, effect in staining uh, in an unstimulated state. When we stimulate, they respond nicely to phylopodial formation. That's why they're not significant. 
However, when you delete the pack to knockout in a in a knockout stem cells, that phylopodial response significantly reduced, and they abnormally start accumulating the abnormal protrusions and effecting bundles. Our same was true uh, with kinase dead and beta pigs. However, with PAC2 wild type, we could rescue all the defects that we saw in PAC2 knockout, and they're as close to the wild type uh, stem cells. This uh, work uh, directly led us to understand in an in vitro migration assays that stem cells are required PAC2 kinase activity as well as its interactions for their uh, both uh, directional migration as well as their uh, proper actin uh, remodeling. Now we took the stem cells and injected them into mice, uh, in, into lethally irradiated mice. And after 16 hours of injection, you inject the my, um, stem cells into, stem, into the tail vein and you harvest the bones and see how many cells that you introduce into bloodstream were able to reach into the bone marrow niche. And when you do such assay, and that's, uh, that's, that's a kind of uh, how many ever cells that reached from peripheral blood into the bone marrow, uh, that's called percent homing. In control cells we have, uh, that's the range we see, and when you delete back to the stem cells uh, stopped homing to the bone marrow. Uh, so we could not detect more than 40% of the cells that were injected reaching the bone marrow. However, that phenotype could be rescued uh, with re-expression of PAC2 wild type. We could not uh, rescue it when we express either kinase they done or beta pix uh, interaction deficient uh, PAC2. This clearly suggests that pa both PAC2 kinase activity and beta pix interaction are required for the stem cells to migrate into the bone marrow. And we also monitored long-term engraftment. So uh, at 16 hours, what you're measuring essentially is uh, stem cells ability to uh, home to the bone marrow. However, that doesn't really guarantee stem cell functionality, right? So to observe whether or not we can rescue the stem cell engraftment phenotype, you have to inject, after injecting the mice, you wait for about 16 weeks to see if the stem cells that you introduced into the, into the tail vein were able to really migrate to the bone marrow and then colonize the bone marrow and differentiate and produce all the blood forming cells. For this, at 16 weeks, you bleed the mice, you look at the control cells, and on the PAC2 knockout cells for their uh, peripheral blood uh, composition and see how many cells are in uh, GFP positive. In control cells, we can see a nice uh, engraftment with the deletion of PAC2. We couldn't see any uh, some blood formation. However, uh, with PAC2 wild type, we can rescue this and we could, express, we could get the nice engraftment at 16 weeks suggesting the engraftment phenotype really needs a PAC2 uh, kinase activity and, and it's a wild type expression. And we further wanted to understand uh, why the stem cells are not able to respond to SDF and alpha and able to form a phylopodial structure. And phylopodial structure in mice and or in humans is regulated in a CDC dependent manner. So we suspected that maybe there was no CDC42 activation in cells. So this is a uh, CDC42 activation assay. The GTP bound form is active, wild type, and PAC2. In unstimulated condition, when you look at the activation of CDC42, we see a nice activation here. But if you delete PAC2, that uh, GTP bound CDC is diminished. And when you uh, stimulate the cells with uh, SDF and alpha, you see a nice uh, increase in CDC42 and the basal levels, uh, although the basal levels were defective, when you stimulate, you can see the 
uh, CDC 42 activation again. Uh, this suggested us uh, the basal level uh, CDC 42 uh, activation in PACT2 deleted stem cells is reduced. And we further observed the basal level CDC 42 activation in PACT2 knockout. And when we rescue PACT2 wild type, we can r restore the CDC 42 activation. However, with the uh, PACT2 kinase dead, we could not rescue the CDC 42 activation. Uh, the BDAPX mutation still can able to reduce uh, rescue the CDC42 activation. This directly uh, correlates with our uh, phylopodial formation and uh, directional migration of the stem cells to bone marrow. And since we saw the basal uh, activation deficiency, we took CDC42 constitutively active form uh, and now we introduce that into PAC2 knockout cells. This is control cells uh, expressing CDC42, and this is PAC2 knockout cells expressing CDC42. In control cells, you can see a nice, very strong phylopodial response uh, with CDC42 uh, overexpression after stimulation. However, and in PAC2 knockout cells, we can uh, rescue the abnormal protrusion phenotype and now start to see these uh, phylopodial structures, uh, suggesting that if you can give PAC2 knockout cells CDC42, you can rescue certain uh, certain SDF1 alpha signaling in it, in those cells. Again, we measured uh, if CDC42 activation can rescue stem cell homing to the bone marrow, where you can see the control cells uh, compared to knockout cells. Now we add the CDC42 back and we can see the homing restored. So stem cells have nice homing to the bone marrow. However, this did not result in long-term engraftment. This is understandable because uh, you cannot uh, have a constitutively active CDC42 express uh, all the time in, in the stem cells because uh, constitutively active CDC42 is toxic for the stem cells. So uh, to summarize what I have shown you so far, when you delete PAC2 in the stem cells, uh, the stem cells have abnormal cell protrusions and they lack phylopodial formation. And they have defective directional migration towards uh, SDF and alpha gradient. And the stem cells does not uh, home to the bone marrow and they could not rescue the engraftment. And they have a basal uh, CDC42 activation deficiency. With wild type, we could rescue all these phenotypes. With kinase dead, we could only was required uh, mainly for the directional uh, cell migration and actin active remodel remodeling and CDC42 activation. The PAC2 interaction with uh, exchange factor beta fix is required for uh, proper F of filamentous actin formation, stem cell homing as well as stem cell directional velocity. Active CDC42 rescued the homing and philopedia uh, formation, but not the engraftment in vivo. So this uh, led to a proposal of this mechanism where we have clearly shown that both integrin and CXCR4 receptors lead to activation of PAC2 through RAC kinases. Uh, and PAC2 RAC uh, GT pages and activated PAC2 uh, kinase activity is required for CDC42 activation as well as phylopodial formation and stem cell migration homing and engraftment. Uh, similarly, we found uh, the PAC2 interaction with beta fix is also uh, required for certain of these functions. Uh, to acknowledge, uh, my mentor David Williams and our collaborator who actually gave us the pack to flox mice uh, from the Fox Chase Cancer Center, uh, Jonathan Chernoff, and my funding resources for uh, as a postdoctoral fellow. So that concludes the uh, hematopoietic stem cell function uh, mechanisms. So essentially, the significance of the work here is uh, it is important to understand uh, how 
the bone marrow transplantation in in patients is regulated and you can do that so by observing uh, all by manipulating mouse uh, stem cells and uh, understanding various kinases and and downstream pathways of the kinases uh, second part of the talk i am going to focus on uh, sax1 protein role in flit3 itd mediated leukemia so th this was a, a hematopoietic poiesis slide I, i have shown before uh, when there is a abnormal expansion of uh, lymphoid progenitors and uh, lymphoid cells it's uh, it's called acute lymphoblastic leukemia and if the abnormal uh, expansion of myelo myelo progenitors uh, it is uh, acute myeloid leukemia both are very uh, uh, fatal diseases and and have very few therapeutic options in acute myeloid leukemia uh, one of the most frequently mutated gene is flit3 and flit3 is a receptor tyrosine kinase it expresses on early hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells uh, it's a receptor with uh, five immunoglobulin like extracellular domain domains and uh, a intracellular kinase when receptor is engaged Uh, it leads to the activation of intracellular signaling uh, that leads to phosphorylation of a uh, number of uh, downstream proteins and th the duplication in the juxta membrane domain of 5 to 50 amino acids is uh, a, a, a important uh, highly mutated uh, gene in acute myeloid leukemia uh, to give you a brief introduction about the flit3 link the flit3 receptor the wild type form that has no mutation only gets activated when it is engaged with the ligand and the ligand binding to the receptor leads to activation of pi3 kinase akt pathways as well as arc pathways the important distinction here is these are uh, ligand dependent activations however the mutation that's frequently found in leukemia uh it, it its activation and uh, is independent of ligand even when there is no ligand the receptor is constitutively active and as you can see by the uh, thickness of the arrows uh, the strength at which it activates pi3 kinase and arc pathways is very high and these are the quantitative differences the wild type activates only uh weakly however the flit3 itd activates very strong pi3 kinase and arc pathways uh, in addition to the quantitative differences there is one key uh, qualitative difference between flit3 uh, wild type and the mutated receptor that is uh, activation of stat5 uh, wild type receptor even when you uh, stimulate it with the ligand it never leads to the activation of stat5 however the flit3 itd uh, does lead to strong activation of stat5 this was the earlier work in the lab where i did my phd and when i joined uh, this was the most interesting project uh, that i could work on so earlier studies have shown in micro rna uh, analysis of flit3 itd expressing 32d cell line these are myeloid progenitor cell line of mouse myeloid uh, progenitor cell line in which uh, when they looked at the flit3 itd expressing uh, gen, uh, expression gene expression signature was uh, a wild type receptor that is uh, stimulated with flit ligand they have found number of stat5 target genes such as pim2 sax1 and sax3 uh, genes also uh, what we found during um my early uh, days in the as a phd student was that flit3 itd leads to phosphorylation of stat5 directly it's a, a in a, a jack2 or jack kinase independent mechanism it will become more clear for you as we go further why i'm saying this uh, when we 
uh, i'll give you the context for this later so the physiological uh, jackstad pathway you know uh, on hematopoietic cells and also uh, myeloid lymphoid cells uh, they express a lot of cytokines and these cytokine receptors do not have their own intrinsic uh, kinase activity so when the cytokines uh, stimulate these st cells and engage the receptors cytokine receptors which lead to activation of intracellular kinases such as jack kinases there are four of them jack 1 to 3 and tick 2 and when jack kinases gets activated they phosphorylate associated stat5 uh, or stat proteins and upon phosphorylation stat proteins become dimerase and translocate into the nucleus and these are uh, transcription factors and their migration into the nucleus and binding to dna leads to expression of number of uh, stat responsive genes uh, among those are sox proteins uh, suppressor of cytokine signaling this is a feedback negative feedback loop mechanism because uh, you don't want cells in a physiological condition you don't want cells to be continuously stimulated so there is a, a natural feedback mechanism in which uh, after a certain level of uh, receptor a uh, signal is uh, generated uh, the downstream sox proteins when they start uh, expressing they bind to jack kinases and inhibit the pathway from overactivation and this is uh, very important for uh, homeostasis in the normal healthy uh, stem and blood cells so my Uh, project here was to understand uh, what is the role of these sox proteins uh, in the context of fit3 itd oncogene uh, first since the data was previously generated was from microarray we really needed to confirm this uh, by doing a qpcr assays so we took either 32d cells or baf3 cells which are uh, murine uh, myeloid lymphoid cell lines as well as uh, murine bone marrow and transduce them with uh, lentil virally we express either control gfp control or fit3 itd oncogene uh, what you see on the red bars is uh, expression of that particular gene in fit3 transduced cells uh, in in both 32d and baf3 cells we see high amount of expression of sox proteins upon uh, transduction with uh, fit3 itd uh, even in the bone marrow primary bone marrow cells so suggesting that fit3 itd expression induces the sox1 expression and all other sox family member uh, expression uh, the other way around when you take uh, mv411 and mon13 these are leukemia cell lines uh, derived from patients and you treat these cells with uh, inhibitors of flit3 signaling the sox protein expression down regulates uh, suggesting that when you in the sox protein expression is a flit3 kinase dependent what you see uh, here in red pkc is a, is a uh, small molecule inhibitor of the flit3 receptor uh, we also tested if when you inhibit uh, the flit3 kinase with the uh, inhibitors kinase inhibitors uh, what happens to the protein levels of sox1 and we see uh, a down regulation of sox1 expression here uh, we use two different uh, flit3 inhibitors a uh, pkc which is a little bit uh, non specific and uh, messy compound however sorafenib which came later on and was much more specific and in both using both compounds we can see uh, the phosphorylation of flit3 inhibition that corresponds to reduced uh, sox1 expression again um, it suggests the take home here is uh, when you inhibit uh, flit3 kinase you reduce the sox1 expression when you express flit3 you induce the sox1 expression 
we also looked at the primary bone marrow samples from uh, control which is a healthy cd34 positive cells from the donors healthy donors or in human aml patients uh, that are either positive for fit3 itd or negative for fit3 itd in both cases we find a very significant uh, increase of the sox proteins uh, in fit3 itd positive cells this led us to wonder uh, what could be the role of the sox1 in in the context of fit3 and when we looked at the literature what was surprising is sox1 has always been described as as a tumor suppressor it has uh, tumor suppressive roles uh, physiologically sox1 expression uh, leads to negative regulation of il3 il6 interferon alpha beta and gamma signaling and sox1 knockout mice uh, die neonatal and there has been number of papers uh, that describe sox1 as a tumor suppressor uh, associated with tumor suppressor activities so that led to uh, uh, our hypothesis what role could sox proteins be playing in fit3 itd leukemia and we had uh, one hypothesis that is when you induce when you express fit3 in in uh, stem and progenitors and myeloid progenitor cells uh, fit3 lead to expression of the sox proteins which in turn shut off the normal physiological cytokine control uh, that happens at in in healthy cells uh, by contributing to this uh, suppression of uh, physiological signal signaling fit3 hijacks the uh, natural feedback loop uh, in order to become more oncogenic to understand this we generated number of uh, retroviral vectors again uh, where we took the sox1 alone or fit3 and sox1 and fit3 together in the same vector and when we express these uh, three plasmids in uh, the retrovirus in 32d cells as you can see and challenge the 32d cells with interferon alpha and interferon gamma both interferon alpha and gamma when you uh, treat the cells with this they induce uh, cell growth inhibition however uh, as you can see in control it's a very strong uh, negative effect it's a thymidine incorporation cell proliferation assay where you monitor cell growth uh, by looking at the thymidine radioactive tritium labeled uh, thymidine incorporation and this is that uh, 72 hours uh, after treating the cells with uh, interferon alpha and, and thym- uh, radio label thymidine you see very little signal uh, in control cells suggesting the control cells in the presence of either interferon alpha or gamma did not really proliferate however both fit3 itd and fit3 itd in combination with sox1 how highly proliferated and in addition to addition of uh, sox1 to fit3 itd re- has increased their resistance towards interferon alpha and gamma induced uh, growth inhibition uh, this gave us a hint that maybe sox proteins induced by fit3 are helping cells from uh, growth uh, negative regulators uh, such as interferon signaling so we 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 took this to in vivo colony farming assays we harvested the stem and progenitor cells again from mice and and introduced the sox1 or flit3 and sox1 and flit3 together into the cells and sorted the green cells gfp positive cells and put them into a semi solid uh, colony farming assay either in the presence of anti proliferative cytokines or in the presence of pro proliferative cytokines that induce cell proliferation and as expected uh, with sox1 over expression uh, the cells uh, start growing slowly however uh, in both fit3 or sox1 and fit3 co-expressing cells did not undergo that 
growth negative uh, suppression so um, the sax1 expression did not really inhibit uh, fret3 proliferative signal however when you add anti proliferative interferon gamma to the cells neither control nor sax1 expression cells form any colonies and fret3 itd since it has its uh, uh, natural sax1 higher expression uh, it, it had formed a number of colonies and compared to the sax1 over expression uh, the sax1 expression cells have much more are much more resistant to interferon gamma uh growth inhibition so we further wanted to see this uh, effects of sax1 on fret3 mediated leukemia uh, development in the mouse model for this uh, again we went to bone marrow transplantation model where you take stem and progenitor cells uh, from mouse and introduce either empty vector uh, lenty uh, retrovirus or retrovirus that express sax1 or retrovirus that express fret3 alone or combination of sax1 and fret3 and we transplanted into lethally irradiated mouse uh, 20000 gfp positive cells and we examine further to see uh, how disease development uh, disease progression happens in these mice as you can see again uh, either alone sax1 expressing cells or control cells uh over a period of time they did not uh they did not uh, expand uh, contrary to that with flip3 itd you you see higher gfp expression in the peripheral blood and when you have sax1 in combination with flip3 that led to much more aggressive uh, expansion of uh, cells in the in the mice and this nicely correlated with the uh, white blood count uh, the white increased white blood count is a sign of uh, leukemia development uh, with flip3 itd you can see uh, a lot higher uh, compared to the controls lot higher number of uh, white blood count in the peripheral blood um, which is a indication of uh, leukemia development when we follow the survival of these mice for a period of 3 months sorry four months and you can see both control and and sax1 expressing mice did not die during this experimentation uh, however that's uh, uh, flit3 itd expressing uh, transplant mice mice transplanted with flit3 itd alone uh, have died much more slower compared to the flit3 uh, itd co expressing with sax1 again suggesting you know when you express uh, sax1 in the mice that lead to much more aggressive disease and lead to uh, lower survival overall survival of the mice um, which is quantified here the graph that's on the kaplan meier's uh, survival curve that's quantified here the median survival uh, of flit3 itd compared to sax1 with flit3 itd uh, the disease has become much more aggressive Uh, suggesting that uh, sax1 co-expression uh, has positively uh, correlated with the flit3 itd leukemia genesis and when you look at the spleen weights uh, uh, the the myeloid cells infiltrated into the spleen uh, inducing higher spleen weights and this is uh, a salient feature in in leukemia uh, most of the leukemia patients also have splenomegaly uh, where their spleens uh, expand really big because all the spleen is also a secondary hematopoietic organ uh, expanding abnormally proliferating uh, uh, myeloid cells uh, in uh, infiltrate into the spleens and livers and as you can see the the disease aggression is a lot higher with when we co-express sax1 and flit3 in the in the liver as well so this led to uh, us to propose a mechanism where uh, by flit3 itd leads to stat5 activation which lead to sax1 expression and by naturally increasing the levels of sax1 in the cells cells become resistant to external cytokine control especially from 
uh, growth inhibitory interferon signaling this lack of cytokine control and a strong proliferative signal that is coming from flip 3 uh, led to aggressive uh, myeloproliferative disease development in the mice both so uh, together to summarize uh, both flip 3 itd expression leads to saxon expression and saxon when we over express with flip 3 it did not affect flip 3 dependent signaling or proliferation however in addition it protected the cells from interferons and in vivo uh, we saw enhanced uh, proliferation of uh, flip 3 itd in the bone marrow transplants and it shot in the latency of the myeloproliferative disease so uh, taken together we concluded that sax1 expression contributes to cytokine uh, escape mechanism in the context of flip3 to develop an aggressive leukemia this was a work i did in in during my phd in the lab of uh, dr sar and christian brands in germany in collaboration with chunaram's lab in in copenhagen uh, both this work and my first part have already been published and they both are uh, published in blood journal and if you have any questions about uh, my presentation and you can reach out to me on linkedin thank you good morning everyone it's time to express heartfelt thanks to dr pavan kumar ng reddy so thank you very much firstly for accepting our invitation and being a part of this webinar come fdp series thank you sir for sharing your profound knowledge with all of us here it was a thorough learning experience personally for me and i hope the same with the participants and your words of wisdom will be echoed in our minds for a very long time to come sir thank you and we would like to have association with you for future events in cbit looking forward to such many more events sir thank you very much